Let me set the stage for our Palm Sunday meditation with the reading of this passage from Zechariah. Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So about 550 years after Zechariah penned these words, Jesus fulfilled them by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, the beginning of the end of his life and ministry here on this earth. And though in the horrific events to follow, death would take his life, death would not be able to keep his life as we will celebrate and remember in the week to come. In usual fashion, God's words came true. And in usual fashion, they came true in ways that were different from what anyone was expecting. And this differentness and the difference Jesus makes is something we will be focusing on today and in the succeeding messages on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Today, we will begin by considering one way in just in which Jesus was remarkably different from other leaders, from other religious leaders. And it is this that gives us the rest of our title, Jesus the Servant. According to this prophecy in Zechariah, and according to the accounts of the events when fulfilled, King Jesus did not come so much in the manner of a king, but more in the manner of a humble servant. And this is paradoxical, profound, and purposeful. When God does different, he does it differently. He doesn't do it because he is bored or to be novel or to get likes. He does it with purpose. He does it to make it clear that he is the one doing the work, making the difference. Even the difference he makes in our lives is distinct from the difference mere human religion makes. It is marked by a peculiar light that human works lack. As Jesus said in John 3.21, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen clearly that what he has done has been done through God. The things God does glow with a unique light. Many may try to copy it, but the lesser invented human forms lack the luster of the real thing, the works of God. I have often thought that one piece of circumstantial evidence validating the Bible as the word of God, the authoritative, absolute revealed truth of God is simply that it is not something man could or would produce. No human would write this story. No human would write the story in this way. No human would or could create a character like Jesus. Man trying to create this story and unfold this plan would botch it in some way and make it somehow less brilliant than that divine light. And that is what all the other religions of the world, all invented are other and less than, quite evidently. In all of history and in all of the world, in all of the human imagination, there is no single religious system so completely other, unique, and at the same time, logically and systematically consistent and perfect as Christianity. There is no religious figure as different, unique, distinct, amazing, and at once so sensible and yet incomprehensible as Jesus Christ. The king of the universe making his triumphal entry on a donkey is but one example. We have considered its prediction in prophecy, 
So now let's take a look at the account of its fulfillment from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were crowd, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. We call this the triumphal entry. But do you notice anything different about this then? How you might imagine a triumphal entry. It's not all that triumphal, is it? When you know the whole story, indeed it is. But from this vantage point, if it had been billed as a triumphal entry and tickets had been sold, I suspect there would have been some disappointed spectators. If my aim was triumphal, I might go with something other than a donkey. Of course, we know that this is God's plan so that it is not that he just needed better consulting on how to do triumphal. He has a purpose in this. So why a donkey? Other than the immediate and important reason, the reason Jesus did a lot of the different things he was doing in this time, which was simply to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill the scriptures. But why a donkey? Many sources say that it was an indication that Jesus was coming in peace. And this may be true in part. However, whatever place peace might have had as an end game, it would only be arrived at through tremendous conflict. The crowds crying out, Hosanna in the highest, had heard Jesus' claims and knew him as the prophet from Nazareth and the son of David, who in some way would speak peace to the nations, but they had little understanding of what was really about to transpire. And there's a good chance that many who were there in this crowd crying out Hosanna to the highest, putting their palm branches down, later in the week would be in the same crowd saying, crucify him. There was quite a bit of confusion going on. His disciples were kind of going along with his instructions. By by all accounts, though, they were uncertain as well of what was going on exactly. And likely they were growing very nervous from the trouble that Jesus was stirring up. The teachers of the law and Pharisees, as they observed, were certain of one thing. Jesus was not backing down in response to their warnings and their threats. And in this gesture, he was declaring himself to be the Messiah, the one to fulfill this prophecy. And as such, it was not so much an act of peace, but a declaration of sorts of war. Let me pause here to highlight an important truth 
and a principle to live by, almost without exception, the change and growth that God desires to see in our lives and in the world does not come about with some form and level of confrontation, disturbance, and conflict. This does not mean that we go out of our way to see conflict and to see as much confrontation and conflict as we can, but it does mean we cannot always back down and away from it and expect to experience the results God desires. Jesus had been following God's lead. He had been patient. He had been strategically confronting and withdrawing, avoiding significant confrontation. And now Jesus, still following God's lead, went into action to initiate direct, relentless confrontation. Turning over tables, healing the sick when he wasn't supposed to. Doing this, that, and the other in fulfillment of prophecy about the Messiah. The time had come. Such a time came for Lisa and I when we were doing church planting ministry with the Pueblo Indian Nations in New Mexico from 1997-ish to 2007. And the, the Pueblo Indian nations of peoples are very resistant to the gospel. And any kind of gospel ministry on Pueblo land was essentially against the law. So we spent a number of years earning trust, trying to work within the tribal laws and restrictions in place to see if God wouldn't open an opportunity despite the resistance and hostility. And after a number of years, we still had no disciples to work with. And we were thinking, if we're ever going to plant churches, we will have to have disciples to work with. So something had to change. And we had originally planned to go overseas and do mission work overseas, so our hearts were being, were stirring, thinking our gifts aren't being used, our call is not being fulfilled. So something has to change. And we decided we couldn't consider our work done with the Pueblo Indian nations until we had done all we could to get the word of God to as many as possible. But that would mean disregarding the tribal laws. Taking the authority that's ours in Christ in the Great Commission and proclaiming God's word without concern for laws that were against it. The results were in God's hand and Evidently, it was his purpose that there be virtually no results. And so we did what we could, and then we spent the next decade serving in Mongolia. In our eight or so years of direct ministry there, we had one confession of faith in Christ. But we have to trust that getting God's word to as many as possible has made a difference that we will never see until glory. So we trust God for that. There was a time to wait, but there came a time to act, even though conflict was inevitable. One of my concerns as I observe trends is that there's a growing temptation among Christians to bend to the culture and to embrace the avoid all conflict, to avoid all offense doctrine, false doctrine, and new theology of our day. And that as a result, we will lose step with the Spirit and become of no use to him as his agents of redemptive change and growth in the lives of others, which includes the conflict necessary for true spiritual growth and change. I recall the incident in which Jesus spoke a pretty hard word. A lesson about needing to drink his blood and eat his flesh in order to follow him. And at that point, a number of followers departed. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, 
Are you going to desert me too? And Peter was backed into a corner and all he could say was, what will we do? You have the words of eternal life, even if they're hard. And so Ecclesiastes tells us there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Included in that is a time for peace and a time for conflict. We need to, like Jesus, be so in step with the Spirit that we know in each circumstance what time it is in that circumstance. Time for tranquility or time for turmoil. In this case, returning now to our Palm Sunday scene, the time had come. And after all was said and done, the end result would be a lasting spiritual peace between God and man. However, this would come about through significant conflict to the point of a stirring up of violent aggression, ending in the shedding of innocent blood, and the sky darkened over Jerusalem. And the result on the cosmic level would be the greatest military victory ever won. As Jesus, through his death and resurrection, ended the reign of sin, destroyed death itself, and deposed the powers of darkness. The Jesus difference was about to make a real difference in the course of human history. And events so different, so strange, so alien to the human mind, so wonderful, we're about to unfold that we still grapple to un understand them completely to this day. Again, no human author would have or could have conceived of the story that was unfolding. And in this grand differentness, there's a subtle and important difference that is important for us to observe and which applies directly how we are to live and follow Jesus, and which we mentioned in the beginning and in our message title. Even as Jesus came to take on his challengers and to bring peace through conflict, he established this great victory in a manner of personal character, very different from that which we might expect, in the manner and with the attitude of a servant. We've asked the question, why a donkey? Because it is an animal of peace, yes, in part, perhaps, but I think it is more than that. The donkey is an animal of faithful service. It is a service animal. Jesus came not as a warrior on a horse, but as a servant on a service donkey. Throughout his life and ministry and all that he did, Jesus was a true servant in every biblical sense of the word. So what does it mean in biblical terms to be a servant? And there are at least three important nuances to this word service or serve or servant in the New Testament, each of them instructive for us. And Jesus exemplifies each of them for us beautifully. We might distinguish these as submissive service, caring service, and worshiping service. Submissive service being that of a slave or bond servant, fulfilling the wishes of another under authority with humility. And behind this is the Greek word doulos, which we find as an example in Philippians 2.7 applied to Jesus. Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, a doulos. Then there's caring service. Serving the needs of others. And the Greek word expressing this is diakoneo. The word from which we get deacon. We find this in Matthew 20, 28. The son of man came not to be served, diakoneo, but to serve, diakoneo, and to find, give his life as a ransom for many. It's also found in the verse where Jesus said, is it better to be at the table being served or to be the one serving? I have come as one who serves. In this verse, we find 
uh, or the next one is worshiping service, serving God for his glory. Latriuo. And we find this in Luke 4, 8. Jesus replied to him, it is written, you shall worship proskuneo, the Lord your God, and serve latreuo, him only. And in this verse, we find both of the two main words in the New Testament that convey the meaning of the word in English that we translate worship. They combine to form a definition of worship that includes submissive adoration of and divine service to God for his glory. And Jesus had an unbending commitment to this. Jesus served in all of these capacities, serving as an example to us as to how we too ought to live and serve. So this brings us naturally now then how this applies to us. So let's, let's ask one another, how's your serve? In your work, in the church, as an employee, a student, in the home. Colossians 3, 22 to 24 says this, for us, obediently, not by way of eye service, not as people pleasers, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, serving. Duleuo, the verb form of doulos. As for the Lord and not for men. Is your service in the church, your job, your studies, your role in the home done as an act of humble service and worship and not in a way to please yourself or others, but the Lord. How's your serve in your relationships? Galatians 5.13 says this, serve, do loss, one another through love. And 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve, diakoneo, one another. Are you working to serve the needs of others in your family, in your church, in the community? How's your serve in your personal life? This is where it gets real personal. In your relationship with God? Or how's your commitment to an adoration of God? Your commitment to desiring what he desires in the way you live? And Romans 12, 1 to 2 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service, latreia, the noun form of latreuo, meaning divine service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. As it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, echoing this sentiment, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God as an act of service of worship. This ought to be the Jesus difference in your life. No longer serving self, but him who died for you. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 15, and he died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. We ought to live differently because of the difference Jesus has made in our lives. Through his service to the Father and to us, Jesus makes every difference for us that really matters. Justification in place of condemnation. Life in place of death. Abundant life in place of Empty, meaningless life. Peace and fellowship with our creator God in place of enmity and separation. If you are here today and you have not experienced this Christ difference, I invite you to come to this humble but confident servant, savior, and king, Jesus. He came to fulfill God's plan and to do his work, his strange and unusual work to save you from your sin and reconcile you to God. Today is the day to put your faith in him, 
to follow and worship him and to serve a cause greater than yourself. If you're here today as a servant and follower of Jesus, be asking God to reveal to you ways that you can improve your serve. Here are some next steps I might suggest. And these are found on your connect card. You can indicate those on here and put that in the bucket when it passes. And they're also included in your program. And you can take that with you and commit to fulfilling that or those next steps. First, I might suggest identify an area of your daily work and your routine that has become drudgery for you or for which you lack joy in doing and resolve to change your attitude and approach to make it more an act of worship unto God. Second, go out of your way to do something to care for and serve another person this week. Ask someone if you can help them with something, not as an empty gesture, which is easy to do. <laughs> you ever do this? Ask someone, hey, what can I do to help you? Hoping they won't answer, <laughs> right? Oh no, they just said yes. <laughs> hoping they won't take you up on it, do it. Excitedly expecting they'll say yes, and it will really commit you to something to do for them. <laughs> Ask God to reveal an area of your personal life that needs to change to be more pleasing to him. And then share this with someone who can hold you accountable to making this change. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that each of us here would come away with something from you that will help us to be more like Jesus, different like him. May anyone here who does not know you, who has not trusted in Christ as Lord and Savior, experience that Jesus difference in their life today and turn from idols and worship of self to serve you, the living and true God. May all of us who know you in that way have grace to deepen our relationship with you, become better servants and worshipers. And may this all be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.